This man has been through processes of changes. So we can only have respect, deep respect for him. And don't remember him for his mistakes. But remember him for his good moments. The key man in the kingdom. And the same calling is on your life. Not only the pastors, pastors are the coaches. If you watch a football game, the coach is not playing the ball. If he does that, he will be sent out of the field. Back to the world, take a shower and go home. <laughs> Actually, the players are better than him to, for football. That's why he's not on the team. So you might be better than we. That's okay. Children become better than their parents. That's okay too. Yes. 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 Yes.
that the coach has something they need. Even he's not playing the ball, he has something they need. That's why he's a key person for them. So you are important, we are important, everybody is important. Different roles, different graces. Different, different spheres of work. But the same goal. The kingdom must progress. In my sphere, in my sphere, in her sphere, in your sphere, but you are the only one there, I'm not there. That's why you are a key person. I'll come back to that a bit later. So, welcome back to Peter's letters. And let's repeat a little bit the process. Maybe because the letters are red on red. We started with revelation. Because without revelation, we can do nothing. I mean, we can do one thing is to go to heaven. <laughs> Change the earth. We cannot do that. Are you with me? So revelation is important. That's why Peter starts with that. He speaks about that we are born again to a living hope. He speaks about the unfailing inheritance which is accumulated, stored up in heaven for us. That's why he said, if you need wisdom, get wisdom. Because wisdom is there. Since when? Since Jesus bought it for us. So living hope, unfading inheritance, irresistible joy, he speaks about that. Because when he strength, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So we have to learn how to keep rejoicing. We don't rejoice for all circumstances, but we rejoice under all circumstances. I believe that's why David said, My soul rejoice. Because his soul may be affected by negative situations. Bad news. Difficult people. Then, then the soul went low. But then he said, my soul praise the Lord. Shake all that off your shoulders and praise him. Amen. Amen. He has put a new song in our mouth. Maybe you have to, maybe you have to cough first. <laughs> cough all the negative out of your mouth and then sing. <laughs> now I feel better. My, my mouth can rejoice and sing. Tested faith. Peter spoke about tested faith. He spoke about prophetic forerunners. Some, some people have been running before us. And now we have to run. We have to be conscious of that. That, that will energize us. Because we are neither the beginning nor the end. 
He is the beginning and the end. But we have people who have been running before us, there will be people running after us. And then the last thing was imperishable sin in our hearts. Okay? Mm -hmm. That was revelation. Oh, it's gone. The next one was determination. So when we keep our eyes on this, what should I call it? Revelation package. Then our hearts become determined. When we are conscious about the hope, when we know about the inheritance, when we know about the foreigners, our hearts are energized. I remember once I was on a ministry trip with some men of God. They were, they were older than me, I was the young man on the team. And at the end of the trip, this five week trip. Five weeks. Five weeks. So after four weeks, these older men, they got tired. And they said, now, Pastor Philip, you take over. <laughs> that was difficult. Because they were powerful men. <laughs> it will not be a happy ending, it will be a, <laughs> be a sad ending. Starting strong, ending low. And we were in Athens, in Greece. And I remember I stood on the pulpit. And I saw these four gentlemen on the first row. <laughs> and um, I took courage and I opened my Bible. And when I opened it, I had a picture of my children. Whoa, I came alive. <laughs> Sometimes small things mean a lot. I thought that I had wonderful children. God has been good to me. And that's why I like photos. So sometimes I think you send photos. In my office now I have a world full of photos. With people, solid people. Kingdom architects. Sons and daughters. So, we need revelation to become determined. Because it this is demanding to stay determined. Difficult. One meeting can wake us up. Strong conference can lift us higher. But we must stay there. Now, I tell people, you, basically, you cannot stay there. But you should not go back to where you were before the conference started. I don't believe we can stay on the same level. Because the conference is not only carried by God and you, it's carried by the whole congregation. It's the sum of everything which just takes us up. It's not even the speakers alone. It's you and me in the conference. We're all so in the spirit. And we are harvest in the spirit. And we always harvest more than we sow. 
So you cannot keep the whole harvest. Because that's produced by the compound efforts of everybody put together. So, so we get home, we fall a little bit. That's okay. Because to keep there, you should stay there. <laughs> you cannot alone carry what 800 people have built up in the spirit. You cannot do that. But we should not fall back to where we were. We should stay somewhere here. <laughs> And then grow from there again. So we need intensive times. That's why we are church once a week. We don't need something every day. Because every day we have to walk with him. But once a week we bring the house together. And then we all sow in the Spirit. And then we harvest from the Spirit more than we sow. We cannot keep that level all week, but we keep most of it. If we hear accurately, if we lay hold of it, take it to our hearts, then I believe we can keep most of it. The next Sunday, we have more to sow in the Spirit. And we all sow more, and we all harvest more. If, if we do that well, everybody goes higher and higher. And the kingdom increases inside of us. Increases in the house. And manifests in your sphere. Okay, so we need revelation to stay determined. So if, if we keep the river of revelation flowing, it will nurture our determination, it will fuel our determination. That's why you must keep talking with him. Because then you see more, you hear more. And you can stay determined. If the revelation flow goes down, let's say it happens to me. The river of revelation flows goes down. Because I don't walk with him with the same attention. I don't, I don't make time not only to read but to meditate on what I'm reading. I don't make time to watch again that video which affected me so much last Sunday, the previous Sunday. And I want to keep my determination. This is what I can be tempted to do. So the, are you following me? The revelation flow goes down. It's not his fault, it's on me. Okay? But even if it flows down, I want to keep the same level of determination and faith and joy. Then I will produce myself, I will produce that. So 
Let's say this is my level of determination. I'm strong. I'm determined. I'm conscious of the hope and the prophetic forerunners. But the, but the flow of revelation decreases. This is my determination. I want to keep it there. I want to stay strong, walk strong. I want to represent the kingdom. But the level of the flow of revelation decreases. What is missing? How we try to fill the gap. Then I will read 10 chapters every day. And I will pray three hours every day. And I will speak in tongues for 35 minutes non-stop. That's dead works. Make sure you walk with him again so the river flows again. In fact, if you drive your car, and the gas goes out, and you put water, it will not work. The car needs gas, period. Your spirit needs rivers of revelation. Regularly. Because it blesses you, number one. It encourages you, number two. But it keeps your determination strong. Amen? Otherwise, we have to produce what is missing. We have to fill the gap. Amen? That's why once I was in a conference for men in Romania. And I should never have gone there. It was a terrible experience. Because these men did not walk with God. They didn't. It was so obvious. The atmosphere was so weak. But because I was a guest speaker, and there was other guest speakers. Actually, the doctor, the daughter of Ed Cole was there. Yeah. So the pastor felt like we have to have a strong meeting. Pastor Philip is there. Pastor Philip. Oh man. So he he tried to fill the gap. So give me one, give me two, give me three. You know, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. And didn't work. So he said, say it again. God is good. All the time. 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 God is good. God is good. And I'm thinking, stop it. <laughs> Do you think that can replace the flow of revelation? I mean, you could say happy birthday. Nothing will happen either. He tried to fill the gap. What should he have done? Bring revelation in the house. Bring revelation. The pastor should walk with God on a daily basis. What, what you heard, say it. Say, oh, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good, happy birthday, Merry Christmas. I mean, nothing happens. Go back to your office, seek his face. Come back when you heard something. And stay there until you hear something. 
That's what Paul said. What have you seen from the Lord are given to you. But if you have not received anything, then you have to walk better. Do not try to fill the gap with prayer or fasting or God can hear. It's like symbols. First Corinthians 13, like a symbol. Ding ding ding. First Corinthians 13. Uh, yeah, the thing. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but I have not love, I am not a thing. Which one? 13 verse 1. 1 Corinthians. Which means I can speak in tongues, I can even speak like an angel. If it's not, but have no love. I should explain that, but I don't have time for that. I am a noisy gong. So when we try to fill the gap, we are just a noisy gong. Clink, 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 clink. But if you walk with him and love him and worship him and hear his voice, whoa, then it's all so different. So we need revelation to stay on the, on, in our determination to stand firm. Okay. Then we went on to definition. And I believe there is a chronology here, there is an order. Because with no revelation or a low level of revelation in our, in our lives, it's difficult to stay determined. And if we don't have determination, the defining process will be too hard for us. Because when God begins to define, draw lines, draw set borders, define our marriage, the role of the husband, the role of the wife, define church, define leadership, that will challenge us. And if we are not determined, that challenge might be too big for us. You understand what I'm saying? Because when God draws the line, it will be His line, not our line. I, asked, I said to, to you yesterday, you have to define what you want to get rid of, for example. Okay, for example, Peter mentioned malice and slander, hypocrisy, jealousy. Now, in order to, to redefine this, redraw these lines, we have to stay determined. Otherwise, we will give up. He said to God, God, I'm, I'm too stupid, I'm too weak, I'm too whatever, too woman. I'm too young, I'm too old. You cannot demand that from me. Jealousy has been in my life for 53 years. 
Then we need determination. All right. It has been there for 53 years. Your government has come to an end. Yeah, your influence has come to an end. Now I take over. I refuse to be jealous. I might fall in that hole from time to time again, but I will get up again. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Because certain things have been there for a long time. And when God says, okay, let's talk about that issue. The line is not going like this, my line is going like this. So you just change that. That will demand determination. Especially if it's difficult for me to change that. For example, for me, I'm born introverted. Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> Somehow I was introverted. <laughs> I don't know when it came on me. When the virus came into my system. But as a boy, as a young man, I was introverted, I was silent. And I've, I've been like that for years, for decades. Sometimes when we had tensions in our marriage, I could stay silent two weeks, no problem. Not because I wanted, because I had nothing to say. Now, women don't know that. <laughs> Sometimes men have nothing to say. Which should be a human right. <laughs> On the Declaration of Human Rights in Geneva, she said, Men have the right to say nothing. <laughs> I have to think, I have to find out what I meant on that issue. Because I was a slow person, it took me more time than maybe many others. Some are far, some are slow. So I'm still slow, you know. God said it's okay, so it's okay with me. That can be my weakness. But when I come to a conclusion, I will never let go. That's my strength. My wife is a bit the opposite. But that's why we're a good team. <laughs> I'm slow, she's fast. <laughs> so we get things done. <laughs> but when she gives up, I continue. <laughs> I take over. It's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> and I found out that's very good for church life. Because church life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. <laughs> So even I'm 70, I still have time. A lot of time. I'm thinking I will be 200 years old. I have time to teach, to speak, to write. I take my time. Because I, because I am like that. But when God wants to when God wants to redraw the land, I have to be careful. When God says speak, speak. What do you mean by speak? You God says I mean speak. But I'm silent. <laughs> so I have to learn to speak well. Yeah, I talk, talk, talk for hours. That's another problem. <laughs> Your problem. But it took some determination, I can tell you. That was a fight of life and death. For me. 
It was. Okay. Ask my wife. She knows. I really had to stay determined. You understand what I'm saying? That's why we need determination in order to get into definition. I didn't want introvertedness to define my life. I want the kingdom to define my life. I don't want silence to, de to define my life. When I have something to say, I will say it. So I refuse to be defined by introvertedness and silence and whatever slowness. God had to redraw the lines. And that took a fight for me. I told you, when I was married, when we got married, my wife invited just two or three guests. I could not open my mouth. So she entertained the guests, I read the newspaper. That was the first years of our marriage. But I determined with myself, it, it will change, I will change. That will not define me for the rest of my life. Okay. Yeah. So we need revelation to to be determined. And we need determination to continue the defining process. Right? So we spoke about definition. And I gave you some points, I'm gonna go through that. I will give you some new ones. Are you ready? Yeah. As I said yesterday, the day before yesterday, it's not a job description. So don't take the list, put it on the mirror in your bathroom. Okay, which one today? It does not work like that. That's God's work plan. You see what I'm saying? It's not your work plan, it's his work plan for you. So don't take the list and do something about it. Start from take one, three, five, seven, and then two, four, six, eight. Don't do that. It's not a system. It's not for your brain. It's for his spirit and your spirit. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? That's why it's not a work description for you. It's a work description for him. But, but he shows us the whole plan. Then he takes it back to himself because he's the one in charge. Yeah. Then, then he will say, oh, okay, let's have a look at number five. Family life. Let's let's look at that. Then later he will say, let's look at certain things we have to get rid of now. Because the time has come to redefine that. Otherwise, it will generate too many problems for you. So let God define the chronology. When you go to school, take an education, somebody else has prepared the chronology. They don't, they don't throw 55 books of law into your face and find out what you want. 
тийг хичээлээ хуваарэ гаргасан маш таны руу шууд 55 ширхэд хуулийн ном шидээ за одоо наадахад ингээ өчрөө нь болно schedule for high school all schedules for bachelor master everything is settled тийм ээ сургалтын хөтөлбөр чи яг нөгөө нэг master bachelor гэдэг дунд сургалт гэж ингээ тусдаг the schedule for you and for me a different an individual schedule for every one of us because you know our story you know how much we can take that's why he does not give more than we can handle this there will always be a way when it's him who is in charge Okay. Mm -hmm. So, oh, no, it's fantastic. Which means define the home, family life. If you are married, if you are not married, let God teach you already now. Amen. Let God prepare the horse for the battle day. So certain things we can we see them, they hold them. Even though it might not be relevant right now because you're not married. Okay, so define our family lives. Define our couple life. Define the role of the husband, the role of the wife, the role of the children. Children are not kings and queens, they are children. Uh -huh. Sometimes, I mean, in Denmark, it's difficult to be a school teacher. Because school teachers have two challenges. Mainly. Besides the primary one, which is to teach. But the first challenge is the children are kings and queens. They are the most talented. Because the parents raise them that way. The second challenge is the parents. Because if the child has bad results, it must be the teacher. It must be the teacher's because my sweet little Johnny is a genius. But you, school teacher, you have not discovered that yet. I am his father, so I know him. He's absolutely genius. Actually, you should listen to him because he might know more than you. That's not a joke, that's the case. School, school parents can be so brutal with school teachers. Even harass them. Harass them. Harass. <laughs> Call them every week. Has it changed? Is my boy learning something? Is he good? It's like, who are you? If you're a school teacher, then be a school teacher. I am the school teacher, let me be the school teacher. Because now all the medias are lifting the children up. Britain has talent. Johnny has talent. <laughs> Do you have Mongolian history? Yes. I cannot take it anymore. I don't know. I cannot. My blood is boiling. 
Because in the process of selection, people show up and have to give an audition. And the judges ask questions, so who are you? Why are you here? It's because I want a career in music and singing. I want to be a professional. Who is your idol? Lady Gaga. <laughs> then, and, um, and how, how, how many years have you been singing? Oh, since I was a child. My mom and my parents always said, you will be a professional singer. Then the judges said, okay, go ahead, good luck. They opened their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> what is wrong with the parents? Some, some of them get angry. You don't know how good I am. And the man is a professional. <laughs> how proud can you be? How arrogant can you be? And then they walk out angry or crying. And, and the parents wait outside. It's a circus. Is this, is this planet Earth or what? The parents outside are in tears. Oh, Johnny. They understand nothing. They don't know what, they don't know what time it is about. It's like when they go to school, I mean, who wants to marry a demon like that? I mean, what CEO will employ people like that? You set them up for disaster. That's why we have to draw lines in our homes, in our families. I'm proud of my children that draw lines in their families. Even lines for using iPhones and iPads. Six p.m. The iPhone is on the kitchen table. And you stay there until six a.m. next morning. You can cry, you can jump, you can pee on the floor if you want. If you not <laughs> Drawing lines. Otherwise, in the future, they will be hopeless. Sometimes they call me. Grandpa, are you home? One hour I'll be home. Can I come? Yes, you can come. They enter the apartment. Do you have your iPad here? I can't see Because they have used all their quota at home. So they start with a new quota. <laughs> I didn't know. Once I was blind, now I see. <laughs> oh, yes, we then make a cup of tea for me. It's okay. No. So define our family life. Okay. Define your professional work. Because in chapter 2, he wrote to the servants. Eight, verse 18. Be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good one and the gentle one, but also to the angels. I spoke about that yesterday as well. Defining is important. And in most Danish companies, employees steal from the company. They all steal. Why do they steal? 
Because they feel the salary is too low. So the boss gives me too low salary. I will take some with me home. <laughs> Even in a wealthy country as Denmark, where the salaries are good. Gossip in the workplace, jealousy between employees. Have an honorable professional life. Be fine. Be diligent, be excellent at your work. That's where we, our life should shine. Life is to shine in darkness, not in the light, in darkness. Be generous in your, in your everyday life. Define your professional world. If you, if you have employees, define your role. This is the way I will treat my employees. This is the atmosphere I want in my workplace. These are the values of this company. You don't have to write God loves you on the wall. Because they don't they don't know how to relate to them. God loves us, okay, wonderful. I hope he gives me salary raise. You can define the values of the company. If you're not a CEO but you are a department head, then you define in your department what are the values here. How do we talk together in my department? How do we treat women in our department? Sure, you heard about the Me Too movement? Because you know people think because they are over another one they can touch them where they want. Uh -huh. So draw, draw borders for yourself. As an employee, draw also your own borders. And Joe Biden is applying for being the next president after Donald Trump. And now they have found issues in his life. He and woman, how they have whatever. I don't understand these intelligent people. I don't because everything you do one day it will come to the surface. It's unbelievable. <laughs> you do something with somebody, it will maybe go a long way around and then come back to you. Yeah. I got to talk to you this once. I was in the airport. And one of my friends, I saw him in the airport, so we sat together. He was a pastor, I was a pastor, so we talked church. And he had a sister who I knew very well, and I knew her husband as well. We were young people in our church once. So I asked him, How is your sister and brother in law doing? And I was asking because I had heard that they had left the church, let go. So I want to know, you know, what is happening? Somehow, the conversation was short, so we didn't. I didn't ask about that. We don't. We didn't talk about that. 
Months later, he spoke with them. They said to him, Ah, we heard that you made Pastor Philip in the airport. <laughs> and he, you spoke about us. Yeah, I heard that. Oh, I had cold sweat. <laughs> because in the airport, there was a lady sitting behind me. He knew them. You know, we sat and looked in that direction, and she sat behind me and looked in that direction. She heard everything. When I heard that, I said, Thank God I didn't say anything. You didn't ask him. That day, not only a line was drawn, thick line that Watch what you say. Even if you do it with the pastor's heart and good intentions, watch your mouth in public. You never know who is there, who takes the photo, and you are on the photo because you are in the airport. Amen. So we have to draw the lines. Because if we draw the line, we don't have to be careful all the time. Oh, how many women want me? Because where are the men? I have to stand with the men because if somebody takes a picture. If you are drawn the line, your heart is clean, sharp. No? Who is this woman standing together with him, translating him? She is he, is he, Bobby? <laughs> the heart is clean. If the lines are drawn, whoa. Amen. Amen. I said to one of my sons, <laughs> who is a woman, by the way, but there are sons anyway. Mm -hmm. I said to her, yeah. you must draw bodies. <laughs> Because under your education, you can begin to draw the bodies. Because when you get a professional life and you are hired by a company, you can get a promotion through sleeping with the man, your the person over you in the company. Maybe you didn't ask, maybe you didn't. You didn't ask, but maybe he didn't ask. You buy a good dinner. Oh, you have worked for me for so many years. Oh, I had a very good promotion for you. I'm sure that's so dream. And I have two or three options. You, you, you are one of them. This is the salary. Company car for free. And so on and so on. And then later you discover the way to that goes through his bedroom. It happens all the time. All the time, more and more. And we've been dreaming about something for 20 years. Yeah. You're so close, just one step, and you are in. Number one is, is a sin. Number two is a deceit. He's lying. Because maybe six months later, he has another option. 
more beautiful than you. And then you will go down the stairs and the other one will go up the stairs through the same bedroom. <laughs> Define your professional life. And you can do that as you go to university before you get that job. Okay, are you listening to me? Yeah. Especially for the young people, but also for adults. Okay, number two, the second one I want to give you is define your pulpit. Pulpit, this is the pulpit. Chapter 3, verse 14. That's a very good one. What's this? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have, have no fear of them, no be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and with respect. Having, having a good conscience. Okay? So I believe. I can hear from Peter here. When he writes to all these churches, every single believer will have a pulpit. Not in church, but in your professional sphere. One day there will be a question about the hope which is alive in your heart. <coughs> then you have your pulpit. Then you can speak about that hope. Don't have a salvation program or formula in your head. Speak about the hope which is alive in your heart. Because we, be, we have been born to a living hope. Say, say I have a hope for this nation. Whoa. Maybe they will be shocked. I want, I want to have a family, I want to have children. Children in this evil world, yes. I will, I will raise a wonderful family here. Speak of your hope. You have a pulpit, God will give you a pulpit. That's why Peter said, do not be discouraged. Don't feel isolated, even you dispersed. Stay determined. Let God define your life. And define this pulpit as well. Always be prepared. He said, always be prepared. So think, think from home, meditate. Say, God, if somebody asks me, where should I say? Don't give a lesson in theology or the Gospel of John. Maybe you should start by speaking about the hope in your life. In your life. The joy. Maybe the stability. Because they have watched you for years. And they have seen the stability in your life. Maybe you went through a time of gossip in the company. 
But you handle it well. It's not affected you. You have not committed suicide. You have not resigned from your job. You're still there. There's still joy on your face. There's still excellence in the work of your hands. They will think, who are you? What kind of person are you? I watched you for eight years. I know you have problems at home, but at work, my goodness, you are here. I know you lost your, your, your father recently, but you are still okay. How come you... Yes, but I have a comforter. I have the peace of God. I have a good father. Oh, I thought he died. I know, then I have another one. In heaven. <laughs> He's alive. <laughs> and he spoke to me, comforted me. Oh, what kind of life is that? Next time we talk, I will tell you more. There is a pulpit waiting for everyone. Are you with me? So as you listen, it's not only for you. As you get insight from your father, spiritual fathers in the house, not only for you. Don't repeat it like a parrot, okay? Don't quote last Sunday's message. I say to people, what you hear, don't repeat it. Because it's still not yours. It's still mine. <laughs> but that seed must fall into your heart first. And work there. Still my seed. And when the plant grows up, it's your plant. Then you can speak. Because it has worked inside of you. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. When I listen to my spiritual father, I don't go home and preach it. All these seeds have to come into good soil. And in a way die in many, many times. You forget what we heard. But suddenly one day it jumps. <laughs> Something happens. It's like pregnancy, maybe. I don't know. Oh, you have food here. <laughs> there is something alive inside of you. Are you with me? So, there is a pulpit for you. Prepare yourself. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the the reason for the hope that is in you. But do it with gentleness and respect. Let's win souls. Don't win souls. Talk to people, flesh and blood, lives, families, souls. So, the soul. Last year we won hundred souls. Oh, I hope you have the whole body with it. Okay, don't become professional. People are people. They are not an evangelistic target. You shoot your Bible verses at them. They are people. God loves them. If you do that, God will remove the pulpit from you. So with gentleness and with respect, it's a life. Amen. You say amen to that? Amen. So that's why I don't like the word evangelism anymore. 
When was this last time you had evangelism? I don't want to remember. I want to talk with people. I want to speak about the hope I have, the life I have. I know there is something called evangelist, but I can speak about that another time. I think we need to draw new lines. Yes. Amen. Also concerning evangelists and pastors and teachers and whatever. All right. Define, oh, so nice now. What did you do more? Miracle. Define your stewardship. Manager. We all have been entrusted with wealth. Not only money, talent, skills, his time. Life is a gift. Have you ever heard people who have been almost dying, but they made it? Most of, most of them will say, whoa, now I will live every day. I will so new life. I thought, I've got a new life. I will look at the nature. I will be with my children, my children, like never before. Huh? Life is a gift. So we have to define how do we manage all the gifts God has given us. I already spoke about family. A wife is a gift. It's not a tormentor. <laughs> a husband is a gift. It's not a pharaoh. When <laughs> comes home, you see the check to bring the home shoes. Are you okay, honey? You need to cook. My grandchildren don't do that to me. That's nice. We need to my wife to do that. She did Are you sick? The home shoes are over there. So, life is a gift, the wife is a gift. Everybody says so. Children are a gift. They do not belong to us. They are entrusted to us. To look after them, we have to build values in them, we have to draw lines for them. We have to protect them. We have to transfer what God has given us, we have to transfer to them. If you read the law of Moses, God said through Moses to the, to the fathers, teach your children when you walk, when you sit, when you lay down. Which means teaching took place in the daily life frame. That, that's where insight is given. If I had known that, or, if I had laid hold of that before, my children might have done better. So we are stewards, we are managers. Chapter 4, verse 9 to 11. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Your home is a gift. Thank you. <laughs> Your home is a gift. Oh, yeah, if I 
had a bigger house. Your home is a gift. Use it. Let it become a kingdom base where God, God is present. His joy is there. His peace is there. His truth is there. Amen. Show hospitality to one another. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. You don't need to do a lot for people. It's hospitality. I know you like to eat, so it's okay. <laughs> but even if you didn't eat anything, people can eat something in your home. Values, thoughts. Strength. They can, they can drink from your life. Amen. In Denmark, in all in previous generations, if you invited somebody, there were three, four, five kids. And I'm not a big eater. Anyway. So the first time I was in Denmark, it was difficult for me. In France, we don't do that. In France, you can visit a person, have nothing, leave the place happy. It's so French that in Denmark, it's called a French visit. Yeah. You go in, you talk, no juice, no coffee, no tea, no wine, nothing, and then you leave again. It's okay. In Denmark, impossible. You have to drink a lot, you have to eat a lot. But then, it can be difficult for some people because maybe they cannot afford that. Keep it simple. If you can, you can. If you cannot, you cannot. Oh, Pastor, don't come tomorrow because our home is, a, is chaos. <laughs> so what? Our home is chaos too. You have not just seen it. Because we only invite you after we clean up the mess. <laughs> so everybody thinks that everybody else has a clean home, but everybody has a chaotic home. That's the truth. <laughs> Don't lie to me, I'm 70. <laughs> yeah, a special difficult thing for women to understand. Now what? Now what begins to understand that? Did you invite them? Whoa! Whoa, please, vacuum and always move. <laughs> Sometimes the grandchildren they play on the floor and they hide under the bed. <laughs> Never hide under the bed. <laughs> you don't know why? Should I tell you? You don't know why? No. Oh my goodness, you have a clean home. <laughs> under the bed you have all these funny things. <laughs> 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 it's not dust. Yeah, like, yeah. So when our grandchildren hide under the bed and then come out again, they are all full of that. Oh, I don't know. Oh, tomorrow we have to do this. I'm good news for you. It's the same for everybody. I mean, a minimum is okay, okay? <laughs> don't, don't overdo it, okay? I mean, teach your children. I listen to a professor in psychology. I like him very much. 
There is a variety of gifts. I don't try to copy her, she doesn't try to copy me. I said, you're free to do that. She says, be free to do whatever. Be a good steward of the gifts you have. What is the next? Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter is serious here. So here he speaks about hospitality and serving and talking and very practical daily thing. He puts it in a much bigger context. Yeah. In order that in everything he will be glorified. Because to him belong, be, belong all glory. So, you find your stewardship. And you first find out what you have. 
Don't look for what others have. Look for what you have. But I don't have that. I don't have that. I don't have that. I don't have that. I have nothing. You have a life. You have a face. You have a smile. You have. He goes to work. Once a new person here. So what should I do with my life? He did yeah. nothing, he was only poor. The Bible says if you don't know anything, don't eat. So said to him, go to Pastor Baggy, wash his car once a week. What? Why not? You have two hands. Water exists in Mongolia. Find a bucket. Buy one. Go and wash his car. Say, Pastor, no car wash anymore. I'm the car washer. But I don't want to be employed. You are not employed. You are just serving. Yeah. Be simple. He never did. <laughs> you know what? Later he said to me, he, he stopped talking with me. So one day I met him. I said to him, how come you stop talking with me? Because you are asking the same question every time. Yes, of course. Are you serving? Are you working? Are you doing something to the kingdom? With all the gifts you have? People having less than you do more with what they have than you could do with what you have. Amen. Let's have a break. This has become so important to me. Because we have seen through the years many people, good people, very determined for the kingdom. But in those days, we thought that's enough. I am strong, I am courageous, I am happy, I am full of faith. Oh, you mean? Uh -huh. It takes more than determination. Yeah. If we don't let God define different things in our lives, determination will disappear, evaporate. Uh, Peter knew that already in Jerusalem. Peter Because when he's after he spoke, people ran to him. They got a revelation of who Christ was. Because at the end of his speech he said, the one who crucified you crucified, God made him Lord and Savior. That was shocking news. The one we crucified, the Father made Lord and Savior. What have we done? And they ran to Peter. What shall we do? What is that? Determination. They were ready. Tell us what to do. We'll do it. Because we blew it so bad. We will make sure it never happens again. We were so determined. So we said to them, repent, be baptized, and the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Which they did. But that's where, that's not where things end, that's where things begin. 
<laughs> the coin came home, the sheep came home, the, the prodigal son came home, all the Jews came home. But what did they after they came home? That's what the Bible says, something I have overlooked for years. Overlooked. I have not seen it for years. Because we Pentecostals. Yeah, Pentecostal. So we been baptized, Holy Spirit speaking tongues. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Story. Yeah. It's because we were raised in a certain tradition. Yeah. If you continue to read, the Bible says, with many other words, he spoke to them. And he said, get out of this contaminated generation. What was that? The first line. It doesn't mean leave this world and live in the mountains. It means draw a line when it comes to the contamination coming from the world. Draw a line now. And the Bible says, these were the 3,000. Something in them have been 33,000. But the 3,000 were the ones who repented, got baptized, were baptized with the Holy Spirit, and began to draw lines in their lives. Then the Bible says, then, 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 just not stop by coming home. Yeah? Then the Bible says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Because they knew this is just the beginning. It's not even the beginning of the end, it's the beginning of the beginning. <laughs> we are just come alive. Now we have to define it. Are you with me? The same when you have your have a baby in the house, the baby is born. Oh, the baby comes home. It's a boy, the room is blue, it's the girl is pink. But that's not that's not the end. That's just the beginning of the beginning. The first night, horrible. Is he going to cry like that in his whole month? Why can he not sleep like we do? So then we have to define lines. Who stands up and who changed the diaper? King Bosco, King Pampers, that's for Pampers, yes. Nano Bomogonian. Yeah. Duke says for me. Now it's your turn. No, it's not my turn, it's your turn. It's my turn. You know that war in Maine? Yeah, you know, you know, yeah. Speak the truth to me. There's no space, no space for lies in heaven. <laughs> so, so then you have, we have to continue to find light. So they devote themselves to apostolic teaching. They devote themselves to fellowship. What is that? They define light. Who devote themselves? They devote themselves. Listen to each other. Tonight, fellowship night. We visit Mr. Abraham and Mrs. Deborah. <laughs> and they came down daily. They, they were visiting each other and having good times and joy. But you know what? That's a choice. That's a choice. That's, that's a line. Of course, we can overdo it. So, couples who have to make an agreement. That's why I said my wife and I, we raised the same way. Hospitable, open home. After some years, we had to draw some new lines because it was more than open. It was like, okay. 
You know when your guests open the fridge and open say, is that all you have? <laughs> then you have to draw a line. <coughs> this is our home. This is my fridge. <laughs> What about, what about going home now? You have been here for six hours. What about going home now? So new lines again. Are you with me? So drawing line is so important. Otherwise, okay. Define your situations. Chapter four, verse twelve. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So God will help us, the Holy Spirit will help us to define situations. This is what Jesus tried when he crossed over the lake. Jesus, we go, we go under. Go under, the Son of God. How can we go under? I'm the Son of God. I created the lake, the first place. How can I drown in the lake? Even if I go down, I can walk on the bottom, on the other side. So they totally misunderstood the situation. And Jesus just defined it. It's okay, that's why he slept, because it was okay. So obviously he defined it right. They defined it wrong. That's what Peter is talking about here. Do not be surprised. <gasps> oh, God, oh, oh, what is happening to me now? Breathing, breathing out. <gasps> Have a cappuccino, sit down, talk with God. Let him define the situation. Amen. Because sometimes things can be... They can surprise us so much that we think they're bigger than they are. Here, the fairy trial, it was to place them. No need to, to be surprised. What should we do? Welcome it. Because it's a part of our tasted faith. You cannot learn everything about the kingdom in a room. You have to get out there and walk. <laughs> you cannot learn to be a doctor just at university. You have to get out there and practice on pigs and cows and whatever. Then on corpses, dead, corpses, dead people. That's a good test. If you cannot do that, become a mechanic. It's easier to operate an engine than a person. My daughter went through that. People let their study when they were going through that. <laughs> they ran out, threw out in the bathroom, the restroom, and never showed up again. That was the end of their education. <laughs> but the others, the others. <laughs> I want to be a doctor. I want to be a doctor. You have to be determined. <laughs> You cannot be a pilot if you're all the time in the what is it called simulator, flight simulator. One day you have to sit in there and, <laughs> and fly, hopefully. <laughs> so define your situations. 
Don't panic. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus did in John 14, verse 1. My, one of my favorite verses. To the chaos, Jesus defined the situation. This is okay. My heart is not troubled. I, I trust my father. Judas is gone. Peter is okay. Philip is okay. Thomas, they are all okay. We will we'll finish this work. He defined that. So one of the things we have to do is to stay calm. Keep our peace. That's maybe my wife's best message. Find your, your inner place of peace. You can think, and talk with God, and talk with yourself. Otherwise, we can so easily react instead of acting. Peter didn't say, be prepared for reaction. He said, Peter, be prepared for action. Oh, this becomes white. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. You have a special gift, use it. <laughs> Define your situations. Next one. Define roles and behavior. Behavior conduct. Chapter 5. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but the examples to the flock. One, two, three. <laughs> Okay. And then in verse 4, he wrote, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud or gives grace to the humble. So here we have three categories of people. We have the elders, then those, those who are younger, and then we have everybody toward one another. Which means crisscross the whole church. So it's good to define roles. So to the, to the elders, we can summarize it with one word, example, the examples. Don't dominate, don't force people. Don't bribe people, bribe. Bribing is not only financial, it can be emotional. Emotional, emotional transactions. 
So he said, three examples to the prophet. Uh -huh. As I said, the first day I think, we should all be who ought to become forwarders for somebody else. That's a wonderful calling. I want to be a preacher. Why preacher? You be an example. The church, the church needs good men to be examples for what the husband is, what the man is, what the father is, what the son is. In the same way, women who can be kingdom women, wives, mothers, daughters, all that is the God's design. So we have to get rid of hierarchies. Family thing. Jesus is a son, by the way. He spoke about his father, my father. Why don't we dig a bit deeper into that to find the mysteries? So his leaders to follow words, his followers to follow words. He found rules and behavior. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. Verse 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. So obviously God is watching how we define our roles to one another. Mm -hmm. Be sober-minded, verse 8. Be watchful. Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Thought just came to my mind. And it comes from this bad habit of quoting a verse and taking out of the context. And we have, I have quoted this verse, meaning the devil prowls around you like a dog and you are even seeking someone. The but this verse is actually this verse is actually placed in a context of relationship, interestingly. The elders as example, the younger people. Humility to one another. There is a whole context of a house, of a family. And then suddenly he says, Hey, your adversary is looking for you to devour you. Resist him from in your faith. Sometimes we have only translated into an individual situation. I have to resist the devil. But the context here is relationship. There are examples in the house, there are followers in the house, there are generations in the house. We are good stewards of God's very grace to one another. We clothe ourselves with humility to one one another. Humility. Okay? And then he said, 
resist the devil. I believe there is much more protection in the house than we think. Much more. Much more than we think. If we connect well, relate well, walk and talk well. And God builds a togetherness in the house. Maybe we can resist him much better than we have done. Maybe we have suffered unnecessarily. I have suffered unnecessarily. I came home in 1991. 2000. No, 2001. Before that, I was me and God, God and me. I had brothers and sisters, I had that. But I never knew what was in their minds. So I never felt safe. Before I came home. And my history showed shows that I was right. I was not safe. Now I'm safe. Now I'm safe. I'm safe yes. <laughs> you answer the question. <laughs> now I'm safe, yes. <laughs> now I'm safe because I'm part of a house. Covenant brothers, covenant sisters. I have covenant Bases, kingdom bases. I have a new position to resist him. Amen. So if he wants to devour me, number one, he has to pass by my wife. <laughs> and that might be difficult. <laughs> If, she bite, if he bypass her, she will hit some good pastors here and there. So I'm safe. That's what I said once I spoke in Malaysia. I was asked to speak a little. For the first time in my life, I'm safe. No? And we can resist him. Listen, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Let's talk about relationships, connections. So this this one thing, resist him from in faith and he will flee from you, is in a whole relational context. So, thank you, Peter. We salute you. You are such a good man. That's why Pentecost, he stood together with the element. If you didn't have the eleven, whoa, watch your mouth, watch your steps to step up in Jerusalem in the middle of a Jewish feast. Whoa, they had crucified Jesus, they might have crucified Jesus in half an hour or stoned him. So, let's define. Define your enemy. What is that? It's not there? Yes, define your enemy. He is our enemy. But we have a house. We have a spiritual family. Verse 10. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. 
бүх нэг мүслим бурхан өөрөө та нарыг төр зур өөрөө та нарыг төр төр зоосны дараа та нарыг төгс болгож багтдаж бичүүлэх байгаж болно. This letter is awesome. Энэ зарчлал үнэхээр гайхалтай. I recommend you to read it. Би таныг бүр уншаасаа гэж хэлмээр байна. Your daily life with it again. Өөрөө дөнгөн дөнгөн дахин дахин уншаарай. Okay, let me finish this and we'll proceed to me. The next one is define your beliefs. So we'll not talk a lot about that. Because I have to work a little bit more. But that's important. In second Peter, in his second letter, Peter wrote about false prophets. False teachers, greedy preachers, many will follow their sensuality and so on. So the second chapter in the second letter of Peter is a tough one. Because Peter is really describing things which will happen. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we define our beliefs. Because there will be many winds of doctrine. And in the same way the internet can spread sound teaching, sound doctrine, you can also spread false doctrine. Internet are you listening to me? So the kind of beliefs will become important. That's why it's good to have a house. It's right to devote yourself to apostolic teaching. That's why he repeats to them, this is my second letter. You must not decline. Build a platform where you are. Influence your, your environment where you are. Make sure there is a flow of revelation, ongoing flow of revelation coming into your life. Determination. God will help you. Find good lives. Keep you healthy, keep you sound. To keep you determined. To keep you well connected. And to protect you from the devouring lion. If you watch Animal Planet, that's a TV channel. I never watch it, but sometimes. And I just saw that the lions, they are looking for the weak animal in the flock. Or the one who just enjoys life. <laughs> Discovering the world. Yeah. Then he ends in the stomach of the lion. <laughs> so that's what Peter said, you know, don't isolate, don't go down. Stay connected, even you're dispersed. Amen. So this is what we saw, revelation. Without revelation, the rest forget it. Then what? You and in religion. I am determined. I am bold. I'm like Samson. No, you are not. What makes Samson strong was revelation. Is what we got. So in this, in these declines, just a question of time, your determination will decline too. And if revelation declines and determination declines, you will not know what to do with what. 
No lines, no direction. Then ideas can catch you. People can catch you. Then thoughts can catch you. So I have to be careful. So there is, there is, a, there is an order. Tomorrow I will give you the last one, the last session. Diligence. That's important. I will show you that tomorrow. The second bit, little fever. He speaks. He spoke very clearly about the importance of diligence. The diligence without revelation. It's exhausting. So you try to do everything all the time. This God, without revelation, you cannot do that. Even if you work for God 24 hours a day, you don't carry like you will die. That's the reason why pastors die. Maybe not physically or spiritually. Because if this stops, the rest stops. I know, it's the same for me. If this stops, the rest begins to decline. How to fix it? Go back to that. Because if you try to compensate, you are on a dangerous road. That's a crazy road. Amen. God bless you. Have a good evening. Tomorrow we talk about diligence. And you can read chapter, just chapter 1 in the second letter of Peter. So you have homework. It does not take hours. But there are so many things that will help me tomorrow. Okay. So second Peter 1 about diligence. And then we are done. Have a good night. Yeah.